Well, I um, uh, would like to welcome uh, Ellen Ray. Um, Ellen Ray is the Lord Bakery Professor of Economics at London Business School, having arrived there 15 years ago from Princeton, where she had been Professor of Economics and International Affairs. Her research has focused over the years on global financial cycles, financial crisis, real exchange rates, and the determinants and consequences of external imbalances, on which subjects she has published a great number of important papers in the top journals of economics with substantial impact, I might say. Uh, we're delighted to have you give this keynote lecture here. Thank you so much, Marius. And uh, let me say it's an honor to be part of this event. It's really a great event. So I feel very privileged to be here. And I'm going to uh, now share my screen. Can you see it? Perfect. Uh, so my, uh, my keynote is gonna be about um, financial crisis and uh, applying some, uh, I, I hope, interesting methodology to actually make some progress in terms of predicting financial crisis. So let me explain. It's gonna be based on uh, two papers, one which is fully written with uh, Jeremy Fulliar and Michael Howell, and one which we are currently writing with Vanya Stavrakeva and Jeremy Fulliar. So the topic of financial crisis has been uh, one of the most important in economics. Uh, so if we think about you know, the number of people uh, having lived through crisis and uh, understood uh, the importance of crisis, of course, uh, there are lots of, uh, lots of great economists there. And unfortunately, we have had a lot of experience with crisis internationally, uh, both in emerging market and in advanced economies. So here I just have a quote of uh, John Maynard Keynes back in 1930. This was, of course, at the time of the Great Depression. And what is interesting is that already then there was the conscious that the conscience that really um, we have involved ourselves in a colossal muddle, having blundered in the control of a delicate machine, the working of which we do not understand. And the result is that our possibilities of wealth may run to waste for a time, perhaps for a long time. Maybe this can be applied to lots of current events as well. But so in that particular case, um, this is. Um, uh, th this was describing uh, how he felt uh, with uh, the Great Depression and the, the financial crisis of 1929. Now, uh, we know also from a lot of empirical work that when there are financial crises, they are extremely costly. Uh, so here I have a, a number taken from the Levin and Valencia database, the IMF database, uh, which talk about cumulative output loss of about 20% over the length of a crisis. So this is, this is of course huge. We know from 2008 as well in a painful way that uh, the consequences of crisis are not only um, uh, financial and economic, they're also social and they're also political. So this is extremely uh, a topic which is of great importance, first order in, uh, in economic policy, uh, first order for the, for the life of, uh, of citizen. And uh, so here, what, what I have, and this motivates the, the title of the paper, uh, this was a visit of the Queen in 2008 uh, at the LSE, um, just after Lehman Brothers collapsed. Okay? And um, uh, the Queen was uh, shown a number of um, economic evidence on how terrible the economic imbalances, the financial imbalances, the leverage was in the financial sector by LSE faculty. So here it's taken from Luis Garicano Twitter feed. So you can see Luis in, in the middle. And, uh, and the, uh, the queen at some point asked, okay, so if things have been, uh, you know, so uh, imbalanced, uh, leveraged, so, so bad, et cetera, why did nobody notice it? And that was, that was a good question. Uh, and uh, so the queen got a pretty, uh, in a way, terse answer on the spot. So much so that after several months, the uh, economic section of the British Academy, which is a professional association of, uh, uh, of economics uh, in the UK, um, wrote a, a three page answer um, where, uh, you know, there's a, lot, a number of points being made and uh, towards the end of the, of the letter, uh, there's essentially uh, this sentence. So the lack of foresight of the crisis Come principally is principally a failure of the collective imagination of many bright people, both in this country and internationally, to understand the risks to the system as a whole. So again, there's this idea that Keynes already kind of had in his quote of we don't understand the system, right? I mean, it's uh, something that is, uh, is extremely hard uh, to grasp. 
uh, and Rhys uh, told me uh, ex post that actually he had answered something to the Queen uh, at the time. Um, and he said at every stage, someone was relying on somebody else and everyone thought they were doing the right thing. So again, that's the idea, uh, you know, there's no kind of broad encompassing view that kind of give us uh, some early warning of what might happen. And this is a problem somehow. So our goal in this work is to give a more systematic answer and uh, to be uh, able to use uh, some uh, kind of re really broad, I think, methodology uh, to predict systemic crisis well in advance. By well in advance, it's three years ahead uh, using some, uh, uh, I think, unusual machine learning tools. And uh, why three years ahead? Because I'm also on the, on the board of the French Macroprudential uh, Authority. And if you want to do something about, uh, about financial crisis, you need advanced warning. For example, one of the tools that the uh, macroprudential authorities have is a counter-cyclical capital buffer, which uh, from the point where it's decided and the point where it's implemented requires already 12 months, okay? So since you need to decide and, and the process of decision is a little bit, uh, may not be as quick as one wished for, uh, you really need uh, to be able to predict crisis ahead of time if you want to, to act uh, ahead of time. So, uh, of course, we know a lot already from the literature on uh, predicting financial crisis. So I, I put here some of the uh, classic papers in early warning indicators, the work of Kaminsky and Reinhardt in particular. Uh, and recently we have a, a kind of revival of that literature. We have uh, several papers by uh, Jorda, Shularik and Taylor, for example, who are uh, in that vein. Uh, we also have a lot of papers coming from the international uh, macro literature by Aishengen and Rose, Frankel, etc. So, so we do have a lot of, of, of those. Uh, the performance in terms of being able to predict crisis and not over predicting crisis, the famous type one, type two uh, style trade-offs are not so great. Okay? And, and the stability across sample uh, may not be, uh, may not be uh, super, uh, super big either. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we know quite a bit uh, from, from this literature. Then there is a bit of new stuff coming with machine learning, uh, but as you will see, so uh, this is gonna be very different in style from what, uh, from what I'm, uh, I'm doing. So there's random forest models, there are some, uh, some people who, who uh, use uh, new machine learning tools to do uh, early warning, but uh, as I will explain, it's very different in spirit to what we are doing here. On the theoretical side, of course, we also have many, many uh, super interesting contributions. And uh, what is striking is that we do have a feeling that all these mechanisms that have been outlined by many people, uh, from the Minsky style of endogenous crisis, uh, Kindleberger contributions, to um, the emphasis on debt, uh, for example, by Mian and Sufi, the emphasis on credit growth, uh, in particular by Taylor, uh, and co-offers or on moral hazard and leverage, excessive restaking, search for yield, and also uh, capital market frictions. All this is no doubt relevant, also balance of payments problems. Um, the question is how we can put all of that together right in a way. When are some of these mechanisms more important than others and what do they tell us in terms of being able to, uh, to forecast financial crisis? There are lots of different models, nonlinear interactions, and structural breaks, most likely. Um, however, there are also some commonalities, um, also most likely, uh, if we believe uh, the, the great work of uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff, um, this time is different, 800 of financial follies, right? So where they say this time is not that different, in fact, and we do have some commonalities. So what we are doing here is that we are going to, uh, to use a framework which has not been used in economics uh, at almost at all, uh, which comes from uh, machine learning, but it's not a random forest, it's not uh, an SVT, it's not uh, essentially a machine learning model, it's about model aggregation. So it's very different in spirit to, uh, to what has been done so far. It's about how one can aggregate uh, any model optimally uh, in order to be able to uh, do the best out of sample forecast possible. So it's not about big data. It's not about uh, getting uh, many time series of things and see whether some of them have some correlation with something else. No, it's about uh, taking the best possible uh, models that we currently have from the literature, from the 
could be even from the point of view of people, I could, could ask Marius what is his time series prediction of financial uh, crisis, and I would put it in, that could be one of my models, okay? It could be anything. And uh, it, it's gonna be about how I can optimal, aggregate optimally uh, Marius with, um, with uh, a logic model or with a um, Bayesian uh, model averaging uh, model or, or with a, a random forest model, all this stuff together. And so uh, why uh, is that an interesting way of thinking about these issues? Because obviously uh, we can put very many different approaches in there. So it's totally, it's multimodal and multivariate. Uh, we don't have to make any assumption on the data generating process, which is uh, really nice. We don't have to assume any stationarity of any kind, non eternal elasticity. No, no, no. We, we, don't, we don't have to make any of those assumptions. Uh, this uh, methodology is very well suited for um, structural breaks, which are likely to be extremely important uh, to predict financial crisis. And it's also uh, been designed to deal with overfitting, so to do a very robust out of sample forecast. Um, it's not black box, as I will show you. And also we have, it's uh, been developed by statisticians who have been working uh, at proving some very interesting asymptotic properties uh, which ensure convergence. So it's uh, very theoretically grounded. This framework has been used mostly in Europe to predict uh, electricity consumption, for example, or to predict, uh, climate, to, to predict climate or network traffic. Okay, so here is the intuition in a nutshell. Uh, it's a sequential prediction model. It has connection with game theory as well. Um, so the question we are receiving ourselves is, are we in three years before a crisis? So are we in a pre-crisis? That's the question. We want to predict the pre-crisis period, three years before the crisis. In order to do that, we are going to use expert advice. But what, what does expert mean? It means models, or it could mean Mario's views, right? So this is, it could mean anything like that. Uh, any kind of economic expert, it could be one variable, it could be what, uh, a human expert, but that's what it is. We are going to use these experts, which are going to be the little, the FJTs, to predict uh, or not a crisis. So to say it's going to be a one or it's going to be a zero, a pre-crisis, so that's whitey hat. And then once we make a, pre a prediction, we will receive the true answer uh, during period T, and we will suffer a loss, which will depend on how far our prediction is from the true answer. And then we will move uh, one, one more period um, and, and, and keep on going. So that's why it's a sequential prediction framework. So formally, how does that work? Well, you have your uh, experts, the uh, FJTs, and you are going to, uh, to find a set of weights which are time varying, the PIITs, uh, okay? So here we have N experts, and you are going to weight these experts, and this is going to give you your YT hat, your forecast. Depending on your strategy of aggregation S, which is uh, which weights you pick, you are going to, you are going to incur a, a loss, a cumulative loss uh, between uh, T equals one to uh, cap T here. And this loss is going to be simply the difference between your forecast the distance between your forecast and, uh, and, and the truth. And that's here, for example, we take a quadratic loss. Uh, this is an empirical question, which loss you want to take, but we take a very simple quadratic loss. So it's uh, the Euclidean distance, if you want. Then the question is, since we are not making any assumption at all on the data generating process, how can we measure the performance of our sequential aggregation rule? Okay, in a way, that's, uh, that's the key question here. And uh, that's a tricky one because, of course, we, we do not know what the DGP is. But so the way we are going to proceed is we are going to define a very important object, which is called the regret. So the regret is the difference between the loss function of a forecaster and the loss function of a certain expert, expert FJT here. So that's the regret. That's how far the loss function of the forecaster is compared to the loss function of the expert. And you see, it's, these are all cumulative loss function. And the strategy will be to minimize the regret with respect to the best combination of experts, which we will know ex post. So uh, once we uh, construct our weights to weight our experts, we don't know what the information is, which information is going to be revealed in, in the current period. Uh, but what we are attempting to do is to minimize the regret between our loss function, 
aggregating of this model and the best possible combination of experts, which will be known ex post. Okay, so that's, um, that's what we are uh, attempting to do. So this way you see that we can do, we can put anything in the experts. So, so if we have good experts, then since we are attempting to minimize ex ante, our loss function compared to these best possible experts, then we are gonna do a good job. Of course, if we have only bad experts, there's no miracle, we'll do badly. Okay, so if you put garbage in, in terms of your set of experts, you'll get garbage out. But if you have good experts and you can build on a lot of knowledge, then you're gonna be able to, to do close to what they do, right? But ex ante, you, you're gonna try to, to get as close as possible to their, to the best possible combination of these experts. And the, the beauty of this is that the regret can be bounded. And the, the bound in particular depends on the log of a number of experts. So that means you can have quite a few experts because it's not linear in N, it's, it's in log of N. Um, and we, we are going to segregate aggregation, aggregation rules, which will ensure a vanishing per round regret. That is to say, the regret is going to zero asymptotically. And we can do that. So this approach is really very metastatical because uh, you can put anything uh, in the expert set. And uh, you can see that the loss of a forecaster in the end, I just rewrote the previous equation, is the sum of two terms. One is uh, the loss of the best possible combination of experts, which we know, uh, you know what this best possible combination is, we know it exposed, plus the regret, uh, which is how, how close I can get to these, to these best possible experts. So in the literature, that's called an approximation error, which is the cumulative loss of a best combination of experts, and the estimation error, which is how, 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 how big or small the regret is, how, you can, how best you can approach this best combination of experts. And the regret goes to zero asymptotically uh, for the aggregation rules that we are going to pick. So I won't have time to go into many aggregation rules. I'm just going to present one, which is the most intuitive and actually the most robust when we have a relatively sh uh, short sample, like it's going to be the case here. Uh, that's the uh, exponentially weighted average aggregation rule. So what is it? Uh, it's very intuitive. In fact, we are going to pick those weights, the PJs, in a convex set, sum to one, positive, and they are going to be uh, computed in an incremental way. So what does it look like? It looks ugly, but in fact not. It's very intuitive. Exponential, okay, uh, and exponential of what? So we have here two types of term. We have um, these terms in L tilde, which are gradients. So these are the gradients of the loss function. And what that tells you is that if you have in the past, if you have an expert which in the past has pointed you in the wrong direction, so the loss function of that expert has, has, been, uh, has not been good in the past, then you are going to be downgraded that experts. Okay, so that's the gradient of the loss function and you, you want to downgrade the experts which have done badly in the past. But how quickly are you, updated, are you updating those weights? Well, of course, it depends on the gradient, but it's also gonna depend on this learning parameter here, eta t, which is time varying. And it's, again, this is gonna be optimized upon empirically. So we can have relatively uh, a quick learning or a bit more inertia. Uh, that's gonna be a, a para parameter which is optimized. So you see, it's a lot more general than Bayesian learning, right? That's, uh, that's the point. And, and indeed we can put Bayesian experts in the set of experts. So this kind of process guarantees that we are gonna do at least as well as the best existing forecasting model Whichever model you like, I can put it in my set of experts. And if you really like it, we can check that you know, it works well or not. If it works well, it will have a big, uh, a big weight in my aggregation. And uh, all the, uh, what I'm trying to, to do here is to do out of sample forecast. So it's, uh, it's gonna do well in the sense of being a good out of sample forecaster. Right, so now I'm gonna show you very quickly uh, some uh, the data and, and the experts and then some results, because I think it's important to see the, uh, the power of a, of a methodology. So the first application is on a quarterly database between 1985 and 2019, uh, which is gonna be a very standard database used by Macroprudential Authority. And the second application is on historical data between 1870 and, and now. Uh, that's the uh, Schularik uh, 
uh, Jordan Shulari Taylor database, which is annual data. So it's just to show you that uh, the, the scope and the, the implementation of the methodology is, is very broad. And, and, and in both cases, I think we have very nice um, results. So for the ECB database, um, first of all, we take off the shelf uh, the official database of systemic crisis episodes. These uh, dates have been built uh, by the system of the, of the central banks. They are first started with quantitative indicators, but then ultimately they have isolated, they have, they have uh, very precisely defined what they call a systemic crisis. They describe what it is. They implement that uh, by uh, some econometric techniques. They get a set of dates, but then they send those dates to each of the national central banks. And each of the national central bank has the judgment uh, to say, yes, we agree with those dates. No, we don't agree. It didn't start in this quarter. It didn't finish in that quarter. You forgot some episodes. And uh, so these are the final dates, which are according to the judgment of the national authorities under the, their peer reviews, right? So uh, there is some uh, peer discussions. So that's the final set of dates. So that's what we, we have. And uh, we could take uh, many countries, but uh, we, we started with France, Germany, Italy, Spain, big euro area countries, Sweden, small open economy, UK, US, okay? Uh, so that's uh, our set of countries. And in order to use our methodology, one thing that is necessary is to be able to learn on a crisis at the beginning of a sample. Otherwise you cannot uh, predict future crises. So this is why uh, the results that we have are on the countries which are possible, which had a crisis at the beginning of our sample. And these are France, UK, Germany, and Italy. Okay, And we are going to predict systemic pre-crisis for those countries. Right, so our pre-crisis indicator, it's uh, three years before the crisis. Very quickly, what variables are used? The very standard variables that any uh, macroprudential authority or central bank would use, or even uh, if you had them, uh, Keynes or Irving Fisher in 1933 would use this. So some macroeconomic indicators, credit and debt indicators, banking sector, interest rate and monetary, real estate, market indicators, external conditions indicators, liquidity indicators. Okay, so that's a um, very standard database, Not, no, no fancy, um, data here. Then what are the models that we used? So for this, we, we took um, the models that have been produced by uh, the ECB network uh, research on, uh, on macroprudential uh, uh, policy. And so we, we took uh, their experts there. So they have some dynamic probit, they have some panel logit with fixed effects, which are estimated either country specific or on the entire panel of countries. We, they also have some Bayesian model averaging, so we take that. And then we add some machine learning uh, experts and statistical models such as GAM, random forest, support vector machine. But also uh, what we add, because um, they have been shown to be good model to predict out of sample by uh, the Stanford School of Thought here in, in, among the statisticians, are logit with uh, elastic net penalties which are logit, which have both a penalty, which is, which is a mixture of, of, of ridge and lasso. So uh, they have been shown to have good out of sample forecasts. Um, so we take, we construct this logit by theme. We do some logit real economy, some logit valuation, some logit foreign, bank, credit, etc. We combine some of those. And then in the end, we also do some logit which are, whose variables are selected by, um, a binary classifier criteria, an ORA criteria on the beginning of a sample. Okay, we estimate some things on the beginning of a sample and then we go out of sample. So, so in, in total, I think we have something like 27 models. No magic number, we could have more, we could have fewer. It's a matter of experimentation. Let's have a look at what we get now. So here is um, France. So France, um, the, the sample here starts in 85, finishes in uh, 2000, end of 2019. Uh, we have, we are going to have uh, the, the beginning of a sample for, for learning, for estimating things, okay? And during the beginning of a sample, uh, what is important is to have a systemic crisis. Well, bad for France, but good for us, we have one. That's this one. Systemic crisis is the blue bar. You have one here. You also have one here. And what we are trying to predict 
is the pre-crisis, which is the three years before that blue bar. So that's this kind of pinkish uh, color here. That's what we are trying to, to predict. So if we do well, we want to predict a one during this, uh, for all this pinkish bar, and then zero everyone, everywhere else, another set of one here, and then zero everywhere else. Now, in the uh, systemic crisis database, they also included non-systemic crisis events, so-called residual events. And so in France, we had several of those during that period. This would be the purple thing. Uh, this is the euro area crisis, which was non-systemic. And the green is just the pre-non-systemic period. From the point of view of our algorithm, we don't want to predict these things. We only want to predict the systemic crisis ones. So uh, we should have zeros also during the purple and, uh, and, and, and green episodes, but we just put them because uh, they are uh, episodes of financial stress, stress which have been flagged by the, by the central banks. So how well are we doing? So we are gonna learn in sample here, and then we are gonna go out of sample for a long period. So let's have a look. Here it is. Everything here is out of sample, okay? And that starts in 2000, uh, one sometimes, you see that uh, our predicted probability of crisis is uh, the line here. You see that we are doing remarkably well in terms of uh, an increasing probability of crisis towards one uh, during the, the right period, then going towards zero as it should be during the systemic crisis period. And here it should all be close to zero. Uh, you see that it's not close to zero. We do have a little spike here. Uh, which happens during the, um, the Euro uh, pre-crisis, essentially. Uh, so uh, from the point of view of our algorithm, it's a mistake. From the point of view of the data, there was a period of financial stress. So that may not be totally absurd, but that's what our, our prediction says. So you see that for a macro prudential authority, that's a very useful framework because you have something in which you have some very clear signal, a very abrupt increase in probability uh, which is something that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, early warning papers do not report the time series of uh, predicted probability. And I think it's very useful to have it in a very transparent way because you could have uh, some OROC, so some class ability to classify which are fairly high. If you have, uh, you know, a small increase in probability here, for example, at the right time and then going down at the right time, you will get a very good OROC, but the signal won't be very strong. Okay, so OROC are not... Uh, uh, a very adequate diagnosis from the point of view of a macro prudential uh, authority. So here you see there's clear signal being given. But uh, the methodology is very interesting also because you can see which weights are associated with which experts. And so here you see, uh, you see weights uh, of, um, of experts, but more in interestingly, maybe we can take a look and I will tell you which experts are important at which ones predict the crisis. So among those experts, some are saying, you know, something is weird. And in the case of France, it's that expert. It's the so-called logit elastic net LC4, which is saying, you know, there's a problem here and you should watch for, you should, you should investigate more essentially. So what is LC4? It's an expert which has real estate price, GDP, total credit to households, rent price index, loans, banking credit to private non-financial sector, price to income, which is also real estate, investment, share price index, equity holdings. Okay, so that's an expert which mix credit, valuation, and very importantly, real estate. Okay, so that's what works for France, apparently. Um, other experts have big weights, but the ones who is kind of signaling the crisis is, is that one in the case of France. How well is uh, our aggregation strategy doing? Well, if you look at the average loss uh, by uh, all our experts, so they are all here, you see that our aggregation strategy does better than any of these experts. LC4 is quite good, as you can see. The Bayesian also uh, model averaging does quite well, but so does P1 in the case of France. If we were to just take an arithmetic average of all our experts, you see where we are, uniform. It's not bad, but it's not nearly as good as optimal weights, okay? which is something that uh, in the um, model aggregation literature, so sometimes people go for uniform weights. And, and, and here we show that it's, it's actually, this one is, does a lot better. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the other guys, uh, they're all here, including the uh, machine learning experts. 
the cumulative loss, losses of the experts over time, that's what they look like. And you see that again, our EWA cumulative loss is the smallest one. That's better than LC4, which does relatively well, and then everyone else is above. Some experts have really an increase in cumulative loss here. They get it wrong. They must be over predicting crisis big time. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what it looks like. Ten more minutes. Yeah, so I'm going to say we, we did uh, some robustness here two years ahead. I just want to um, also say we provide some uh, standard diagnosis takes like the OROC uh, and the root mean square errors, which are uh, provided in our paper. So for those of you who are not familiar, the OROC is the area under the ROC curve. What you want to do is to have an OROC as close to one because uh, that would mean you you predict well crisis and you don't over predict crisis. That's a type one, type two error trade-off. Um, so this is, uh, the OROC is, is drawn for all the, 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 the for optimal thresholds here. So that means, again, that's, that was the problem I, I discussed before. If you have a tiny increase uh, of probability at the right time, you're gonna get a very nice OROC, uh, which you know, may not be a super strong signal. But nevertheless, it's an important diagnostic. So we report it. And what we find in the case of France is the methodology works extremely well. You see that our aggregation methodology gives an OROC which is 0.98, which is pretty amazing out of sample. It's way better than uniform. It's better than other aggregation rules that we looked at here. It's better than the, big, the best fixed convex combination. How is that possible? It's because asymptotically they tend, uh, one tend towards the other. However, here, uh, we have in EWA, we have time varying weights, while this is the best fixed convex combination non exposed, but it has fixed weights. Okay. So, uh, so that's why we can have an OROC which is actually better here. It's unusual for other countries, we don't, but, but here we have it. And the root mean square errors are, are, are very small. You see, they are uh, also way smaller than for the other uh, possibilities. Okay. How are we doing very quickly then? Is it uh, France is doing is a very good, um, gives very good results. The UK gives fairly good results as well. Uh, so if we look at uh, uh, the experts that give a signal for the UK, you see that we pick up the right timing. It lasts a bit too long here, and we have another spike here at the time of the Euraria crisis. Uh, but over, uh, it's, uh, it's very informative as well. So for the UK, what comes out is the statistical expert GAM. And the logit risk, which uh, so the GAM has um, long term interest rates, plenty of uh, nonlinear combinations, also with price to rent. So it's a mixture of uh, housing and uh, long term interest rates uh, style of things. Uh, and uh, some, so the other, the other models with high weights are about valuations and risk appetite, essentially. So it's a bit different than France. Um, also, very good OROCs, okay. Uh, so I don't have time to go into that. I just show you Deutschland. Deutschland, so Germany, uh, it's uh, pretty good as well, even though it seems that over time we are doing less good with that model. Here it's a panel model which has long-term interest rate, price to rents, public debt, equity holdings, banking credit to GDP gap. That seems to do the job. Uh, if we look at uh, the Eurox are not as good. Huh? So uh, compared to France and the UK, uh, it's not as good. Uh, same thing, Italy. Italy, what is interesting is that what comes out are models which are more with the real side of the economy, consumption, investment. We have some survey on housings, uh, total credit to households, and we have some external factor as well. But it's consumption investments uh, are, are kind of variables which were not there for the other countries. There, you see that uh, the fit is not, is not as good, but it nevertheless quite high compared to the, to the literature. Okay, so, uh, in my last five minutes, so far, what did we learn? I think that it's possibly, it's a very powerful approach here. It uh, deals very well with structural breaks, differences across countries. Uh, now, could this approach be used across a uh, very long time series? Okay, in a way that's, that's, that's a very in interesting question. And we are answering this question using the, uh, the, the uh, Jorda Shulai Taylor database, which goes from uh, 1870 to, uh, to now. And the question we ask, which is extremely ambitious, is can we predict out of sample the Great Depression, learning on the uh, past 19th century uh, crisis uh, and the beginning of the 20th century crisis, 
and other models which predict the Great Depression out of sample, the same model that, predi that predict the current crisis, uh, the end of the 20th century and 21st century crisis. So that's a very, very ambitious uh, set of questions. And uh, so very interestingly, <laughs> we are going to answer yes. I mean, we're going to answer yes to can we predict uh, the Great Depression out of sample? Can we predict also the other crisis? Uh, are they the same models? So then that will depend on the countries. Uh, so here, let me give you a, a little bit of, uh, of the results uh, that we are going to have. Uh, I don't have time to describe the experts. We have uh, here, we have 12 experts. Here are the samples that we are going to use. Uh, for the US, we learn until 1906. You want again to learn on crisis. So here we learn on two crises because we have annual data. So that gives us six ones and a lot of zeros. Okay. Um, and then we go online from 1906. For France, we would learn until the 1920 to get two crises. And then we go online from 1920 to 2017, etc. You see the samples here. Right. So here is our results. Uh, to the, the, our US results. And we can still probably improve on those. These are the first sets of results that we have. So uh, again, uh, the systemic financial crisis are in purple and uh, the pre-crisis that we are trying to predict are in blue. As you can see, we do very well. We predict out of sample after 1906. So everything here is out of sample, okay? We predict 1929. We over predict here. So there seems to be quite a lot of turmoil from the point of view of our algorithm, at least in the 1930s and 40s, up to the 50s. After the 50s, we see a period, a quiet period in terms of low probability of crisis. And actually, that's right. So this is uh, this period, the post Bretton Woods, is known for having very few financial crises. So it's kind of remarkable that we get that, right? But it's a very low probability. And then we have the savings and loans crisis in the US, which is picked up here. And then we have 2000, 2008, essentially, which is picked up as well. So we are doing quite well. And there you see that the probability goes down, but relatively lagged. There's also the euro area crisis during that period. So which uh, models actually give the signals? Interestingly, what we find is that we tend to find that the blue and the purple gives 2008 and 1929. And the purple gives mostly uh, the savings and loans. Now, what are those guys? So the, uh, the purple, uh, the ones which, sorry, yes, the, the purple is the one is LC4. So that's stock prices, loans, mortgages, and debt to GDP, okay? Which uh, is at work in 1929, 1984, and 2008. And for 1999 and 2008, we have on top of that, we have also long-term interest rate, real GDP per capita, GDP, and broad money. Okay. So that's, that's a richer set of variables than, than 1984. So that's, I think, an interesting, uh, an interesting result. I want, so the rock are very high, can out of sample. Uh, I uh, am going to not have time to show you the other result, but there's, there's one uh, country I just want to show you so that you see that it's not linked to people having crisis on the same dates, because we have Japan in the sample, which is very, very unusual in the sense that it didn't have 2008, but it had a 1997 uh, systemic crisis. And you can see here, we predict something in the 1930s. We predict a lot of other stuff there. So I would have to go into the history of Japan to see what was going on in that period. Then we have a very uh, quiet uh, period here, uh, as it should be. But then we do pick up the increase in systemic risk in 1997, okay? And, and there, what is uh, driving these results? Uh, apparently, it's uh, loans, population, real GDP per capita, short-term interest rate, long-term interest rate, stock prices, house prices, and a random forest. We would have to, to see what variables enter exactly there. So we do that. Uh, we have a bunch of countries. We have Spain also with a very interesting crisis uh, in the middle of, uh, in the 70s here which was a balance of payment crisis linked to, the, uh, to oil. And actually, when we look at a uh, model predicting that one, uh, this seems to be um, investment to GDP ratio exports and exchange rate. So that seems to make sense. Uh, we also have Italy, we have uh, Netherlands, 
and we have Portugal. So as you can see, we always predict the kind of Bretton Woods period with very low productivity of credits. So I'm just want, going to conclude now. Uh, this, these are two papers. One is finished, the first one. The second one, we are still working on it. And I think the answer to the queen appears to be that if you are a macroprudential authority, you really want to use machine learning tools to know when you have to actually <laughs> investigate deeper. It can give you a kind of warning here. And the answer to the second question is this time different. So that's the, the reinhardt rogoff question. Uh, well, not really, because we managed to predict crisis. But however, there are definitely some different flavors. And uh, this methodology picks them up. So uh, last open questions, many, of course, but very <laughs> two big ones. We cannot predict out of the blue crisis with this. If it has never happened before something, uh, you're never going to pick it up. Cyber risk, I don't see how we would pick that up. Um, there's no causality. It's only about out of sample forecast, but we can see that the models that contain information seem to make sense from a narrative point of view, but we don't have any formal way of uh, proving any causality of any kind here. So that's it. And maybe I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> Perfect. Questions. Okay. So uh, we can take uh, some questions.